Keith, you know, I was watching um, the landing of this capsule and a crew on ground very, very carefully uh, opening the door, inspecting each of these Taikonauts, and it took some time before each one very methodically was taken out and put on a stretcher, and I believe we have video of that as well we can put on the air. Talk to us what this involves. I mean, can these Taikonauts, technically speaking, after being in space for six months, can they actually walk on the ground? You know, that's it's an interesting question. The answer is probably yes. I have friends of mine who've come back and have said, yeah, I, you can do it. But what they're trying to do is sometimes some people come back to Earth and they're dizzy or they're disoriented and they want to make absolutely sure that nothing bad's going to happen. And why not take the time to be certain? But uh, I've had astronaut friends say, yeah, I could have hopped out of that spacecraft and walked around. And you probably ask that question because if we're going to go to other planets and we're going to land, can we get out and do all that science? The answer is, yeah, we can. So this is really out of, uh, this is a precautionary move, basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and also they may actually, sometimes when they land, there's a few tests they do the moment they land, and they may be doing that. I don't know. I haven't seen what, what's going on with this mission, but it's a precautionary measure. They're just being careful. Okay, so I have another silly question to ask you. How soon can they eat normal food? Um, pretty quickly. Usually, I understand they, uh, you know, they, they get in the van and they go back to the base and they eat whatever they want. Unless they don't feel good. <laughs> Usually they're hungry. It tells you where my head is, you know. The food is really, really important. Okay, so talk to me. Walk me through what these three Taikonauts are going to go through in the next several days and weeks in terms of really getting adjusted to life back on planet Earth. Well, you know, it's going to be interesting because you, you've been in a weightless environment where, you know, up and down, you could, it just, just depends how you, I'm doing this on purpose, you orient yourself. But I've had friends that have come back and they said, you know, they sit there and they'll drink a cup of coffee and they'll just let go of the cup and, they, oh, you know, I mean, it, 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 you have to adjust to that. Sometimes the fluids in your body tend to want to move around because when you're in space, they move up and when you come back, they go down. Sometimes you have a head cold. So you have to, and you, your walking can be a little uneasy. If you turn quickly, you might get dizzy. So the first week or two, you take it easy, but then it, it usually people are just fine within a day or two. Is this Tiangong space station that China has built, is it similar to ISS? You know what, I was just thinking about this today because I knew I'd be on. I worked on the, the International Space Station program in the 1990s, and our pictures and our diagrams and everything nice and clean and orderly, and everybody stood there and did their science. Then we brought the Russians in, and I wanted to do something that involved a cable going somewhere because the Russian spacecraft was all sort of jittery inside. And they say, oh, you can't do that. Well, now, if you look at our space station, there's stuff all over the place. So my prediction for China is you'll have a successful space station with this junk all over the place and wires and people all floating around like this. So that, that's the future for China's space station, to get messy. Well, how close do you think China is to putting a man on the moon? Well, you know, it just depends who you talk to. Um, I'm talking think, to you, Keith. Okay, all right. <laughs> uh, you want to bet within, by the end of this decade, somebody will be walking on the surface of the moon. Well, even China says by 2030, so you're not giving me any new yeah, scoop I, here. Yeah. Well, uh, this, this is inevitable, and it's not going to be just one country when we go back, it's gonna, and it's going to be many countries and joining together and doing robotic as well as uh, human research. So it'll be a little bit different this time. You know, and the U.S. space program uh, was really seen as holding a significant edge over China. Do you think that's still the case, Keith? You know what? I grew, I'm, I'm in my late 60s, so I grew up in the 60s when the space race was going on. We had the Soviets and Americans, and maybe a little bit of the Europeans and the Japanese. But it was two, two different technologies. One technically won the race, but now if you look at the International Space Station, it's part Russian, part American, and some other commercial stuff in between. And if you look at China's space station, they paid attention to how to do one, and it looks a bit like ours in many ways because that's how space stations look. So I think you know, what you're going to see over time is that you, there's more than one way to do a space station, but there's some things that are in common. 
And I think over time, as more players come involved, some countries and some companies will have more capabilities than others. Some will have an overlap. There'll be some friendly competition, and there'll be a lot of cooperation. Multipolar is the world. This is space uh, By the way, this is space dis diplomacy week. So I should be talking about everybody cooperating. Yeah, we like that word, cooperation, especially when it comes to China and the United States. We're going to leave it there. Keith Cowing, thank you very much. My pleasure.